Hello. In this video, we're going to talk about Mishkin and Ungerlater's work on the visual pathways. You will remember that once light hits the retina, visual information travels to the lateral geniculate nuclei in the thalamus, and it then arrives in the primary visual cortex, in the occipital lobe. You also remember that this area is called the striate cortex and also goes by the names of V1 and Broadman Area 17. Also, recall that this path is organized contralaterally. That is, that the primary visual cortex of each hemisphere processes the input from the opposite visual field. But what happens once information leaves area V1? Is there a single path that it takes? Mishkin and Unger Leiter suggest that there are two functionally distinct neural routes that start from the primary visual cortex. But whereas one ends in the posterior parietal cortex, the other ends in the inferotemporal cortex. The first one is called the dorsal pathway. The second one is called the ventral pathway. Mishkin and Unger Leiter's hypothesis is that these two anatomically distinct paths also correspond to two functionally distinct visual systems each specialized in a different kind of information. The dorsal pathway would be in charge of carrying information relevant to object location, and it is called the wear pathway for this reason. The ventral pathway, on the other hand, is in charge of object identification, and so it is called the what pathway. Before Mishkin and Unger Leiter's work, there was some preliminary clinical evidence pointing in the direction of the what wear distinction. That evidence came from brain damage patients. It had been observed that damage to parietal and temporal lobes produces different types of visual impairment. Patients with parietal damage had exhibited problems acting on and locating objects, for instance, in the syndrome of uh, visuospatial neglect, also called hemi neglect. In contrast, patients with damage to the temporal lobe had problems with the identification of objects. For instance, the condition of agnosia, namely the inability to recognize objects. For instance, in a kind of uh, agnosia, you would have people that in this picture can only report one or two objects, just that. And notice that these people can see the lines and they can report the traces here and the colors. It's just that they can't integrate it into objects and recognize them. This form of agnosia is caused by damage to the dorsal stream. Now, be on your guard. The following kind of inference is deeply problematic. Premise. Patients with damage to area X tend to have difficulty with tasks involving cognitive domain A. Therefore, the or A function of area X, as opposed to areas Y or W or Z, is A. This is problematic because how do we know that the impairment is due to the damaged area? How can we rule out the possibility that another area, Y, is actually responsible for the function in question, and the damage to S simply prevents information from being processed in Y. We need to show the functional independence of X from other areas. Showing independence requires what is called double dissociations. A dissociation is a situation in which one function is preserved, while another function is impaired. For instance, a patient, call him Al, presents a single dissociation. His naming objects ability is impaired, whereas he can locate objects. A single dissociation, such as this, in which uh, one function is lost while another function remains, suggests that the two functions, in this case locating and naming objects, involve different mechanisms, although we still don't know whether they're really independent of each other. We can illustrate double dissociation by finding another person who has one function present and another absent, but in a way that is opposite to well. For example, Beth, who, say, has a parietal lobe damage, can identify objects but can't tell exactly where they are located. The cases of Al and Beth taken together represent a double dissociation and show the independence of the mechanisms involved. However, Mishkin and Unger Leiter employed another kind of evidence. Brain damage cases are nature's own experiments, and nature's experiments are often messy and very imprecise. So these researchers decided to perform their own series of studies. I'm going to give you first the big picture of what they did, and then we'll look at some details. 
So their experimental method involved a procedure called ablation or lesion. An ablation is the destruction or removal of some tissue in the nervous system. Most ablation experiments have used monkeys because of their similarity of the visual system to that of humans, and also because they can be trained in tasks that are useful to measure cognitive function, such as visual acuity, color vision, depth perception, etc. The first stage of an ablation experiment is to determine the animal's capacity by testing it behaviorally. The task that Mishkin and Orger Leiter use was one of object, so the first task is one of object discrimination in one of the studies. Here a monkey was shown one object, such as a rectangular solid, and was then presented with a two-choice task like the one shown in the picture, which included the target object, the rectangular solid, and another stimulus, such as the triangular shape. If the monkey pushed aside the target object, it received the food reward that was hidden in a well under the object. The second was called the landmark discrimination task. Here, the monkey had to remove the food well cover that was closest to the tall cylinder. So it was a task of location rather than of shape or, or pattern. So once the animal's perception had been measured, a particular area of the brain is ablated, either removed or destroyed. And this is done either by surgery or by injecting some chemical. So ideally, one particular area is removed and the rest remains intact. After the ablation, then the monkey is retrained to determine which perceptual capacities remain and which have been affected by the surgery. In the ablation part of the experiment, part of the temporal lobe was removed in some of the monkeys. Now, these subjects had difficulty in performing the object discrimination task. This result seems to suggest that the pathway that reaches the temporal lobe is involved in object discrimination. Thus, Mishkin and Unger Leiter decided to call this the Watt pathway. Another group of monkeys had part of the parietal lobe removed, and their problems were with the landmark discrimination task. This suggested that the pathway leading to the parietal lobe from the striate area was in charge of determining an object's location. Because of this, the experiments decided to call this pathway the where pathway. This picture shows the two paths postulated by Ungerleiter and Mishkin. One, the dorsal one, is the where pathway. The other is the ventral one. It's called the what pathway. What I just recounted is a quick overview of the studies. However, it will be worthwhile to take a closer look at the experiments themselves. Remember that the cerebrum is divided into hemispheres and that the areas of the cortex are thus duplicated. Moreover, you will also recall that hemispheres can communicate through the corpus callosum and that this allows one hemisphere to compensate for damage in the other hemisphere. Thus, when trying to determine neural pathways, we may also want to determine how much communication there is between the structures of the two hemispheres. To investigate this issue, they use cross-lesion disconnection experiments, which are designed to trace the connections between hemispheres. These experiments involve the eventual transection, or severing, or cutting, of the corpus callosum. Let's take a closer look. Okay, again, let's take the landmark tasks experiments. These involve the ablation of part of the parietal cortex. Now, given the duplication of areas in both hemispheres, we have that the dorsal pathway actually involves four paths. Two paths live from the left striate cortex, or primary visual area. Let's call them A and B. A goes from the left striate cortex to the right parieto occipital area by way of the corpus callosum. This involves both hemispheres. Path B goes from the left striate cortex to the left parietal area, and so it is strictly intrahemispheric. It stays within the same hemisphere. Paths C and D start from the right striate cortex and are inter- and intrahemispheric, respectively. After the monkeys were performing in the landmark task to a criterion of 90% of success, the first stage of the experiment consisted in the removal of the left parietal area. Since this area is the last station in paths B and D, both of these paths were eliminated, whereas paths A and C remain. The result was what the authors considered as minimal damage. Whereas before the operation it took the monkeys 10 trials to master the task, after the surgery they still could do it, but it took them 130 trials. 
On the second stage, the right striated cortex was eliminated. This knocked out path C, so that only path A remains. The resulting damage was substantial. Whereas before the operation, monkeys needed 70 trials to learn the task, afterwards they required 880 trials. This suggests that intra-hemispheric connections are of great importance for learning the location of objects. This was confirmed by the next stage. In this stage, the corpus callosum was eliminated, so that no paths remained. The result was some impairment, but not too dramatic, at least in comparison with the previous stage. This corroborated the idea that intrahemispheric connections are more important than interhemispheric ones for the dorsal path. Again, this contrasts with the outcome of the experiments that involved the removal of areas of the ventral paths in monkeys doing the object discrimination test. In these cases, there wasn't any severe deficit until they had their corpus callosum removed. It was only then that you had a drop really in performance. So this suggests that this pathway is more dependent on interhemispheric communication than the dorsal pathway. So this is Mishkin and Ungerleiter's interpretation of the results. They have a dorsal path and they call it the location path, the where path. And then the ventral path is the identification one. About some years later, another pair of researchers, Milner and Goodale, had another proposal. They called the dorsal path vision for action and they called the ventral path vision for perception or identification. So, some general points about this kind of research, the one done by Mishkin and Unger later and carried out by also by, continued by people like Milner and Goodale. Well, first, it, in contrast with uh, Mars' proposed top-down approach, this is more of a bottom-up approach. And now, how bottom-up it is, I'll hear your opinion in the discussions. Also, it reveals the interdisciplinary nature of cognitive science. So you have uh, lesion experiments, on monkeys. You also have single uh, neuro neurophysiology that was, well, we didn't report that, but that was also involved. And also you have experiments, cognitive psychological experiments on brain damage and normal subjects. And it also reveals a basic challenge in cognitive science, that of integrating functional analysis that have to do with the flow of information and how you can really integrate it or connect it to anatomical analysis, something which is not straightforward. Okay, that is all for now. Bye. Cheers.